members of the panel. From the side of government, we believe that putting people with drug dependency problems for the offenses that they have committed in prison is not only a disproportional and unfair measure, but also worsens the situation for society. We will go, we're going to tell you that fundamentally, the standards that need to be met to put people in prison are not met in the case of people with drug dependency problems. We will also tell you that society has contributed to this problem and so it's only fair that society also takes upon part of the responsibility for these people. But first, let me lay down some of the context that's necessary for this debate. When we talk about offences committed by people with drug dependency, we're naturally talking about a situation where there is some sort of a nexus between their drug dependency and the offence. So for example, if we think that these are people who are dependent on drugs and then engage in drug fueled violence, or we think that these are people who commit crimes under the influence of drugs, then we think that all of these are covered by this broad definition. We also understand that the effectiveness of these drug dependency treatment itself is fairly well settled by now. We see that in a majority of cases, people are able to come out of their addictions to these drugs. And in any case, we think that there are a lot of measures that can be put in place to ensure that it's not the case that as soon as the treatment is over, these people go back to the using the drugs. Right. Right? So we think that some sort of a system similar to a probationary system, where they have to like turn up for regular checks or regular talks with their counselors, even after the treatment is over, can be put in place to ensure that. What we mean by this sort, what, the reason why we think this sort of a model is necessary in a context like this is fundamentally because we think that there's a difference between the idea of prison and the idea of treatment that we're talking about here. We think the purpose of prison, as well as the purpose of medical treatment, should be to keep society safe, but in different ways. For prisons, we think the reason why we put people in prison and exclude them from interacting with the rest of society is because we think that there is no way in which these people can interact with society without causing harm to society. So if these are people who have consistently displayed a trend to commit a, a trend to commit crimes against society, we think that it's okay to put them in prison. But what is the difference with people who do these crimes consistently, even or otherwise, as a result of drug dependency? We tell you fundamentally that there is an element which mitigates their culpability. Because the nature of criminal sanctions is such or is of such a grave nature, by completely taking away some of your most basic rights, we think it should only be reserved for people who have had the choice to commit that crime and chose to commit that crime. In the case of people with drug dependency, we don't really think they had a real choice. Because the nature of the influence of these drugs on them was to ensure that they weren't really thinking about the consequences of their actions, that they weren't really Point. thinking about what the law allowed them to do or didn't allow them to do before they committed these crimes. In a way, we think an appropriate analogy is that if a man is holding a gun to your head and forces you to commit a crime, we don't think it's fair to put you in prison. Instead, Point. we think that you should be addressing the source of the problem, which was the man holding the gun. In this case, that's the drugs, ladies and gentlemen. We also think that it's important that society moves towards some amount of reformation rather than punishment through prison. As we are in an age where we are increasingly recognizing the importance of reformation. We understand that this is important for two reasons. First is the fairness angle, which is that these are not really people who have committed these crimes, so it's not fair Point to punish them through prison. But more importantly, these are indeed individuals who can very well be integrated back into society, and these are people who have the potential to contribute back to society. We think reformation is particularly suitable for a situation where if you can address the root cause of these things and allow these people to lead perfectly normal lives in society subsequently, we think reformation is indeed the fair and suitable thing to apply over here. We also think that to a large extent you can't really say that these people made a choice to do these drugs in the first place. This is where we are going to tell you that society itself also has a massive role in the kind of situation that we are seeing right now where offenders with drug dependency exist. We see in society governmental policy that has consistently failed to control the access of drugs to these people. We see governmental regulation that's uh, governmental steps that have failed to convincingly educate people about the harmful effects of starting these drugs in the first place. We see that the, we, have, we live in a world with a media where the usage of drugs is something that's often glorified and is indeed something that serves as a strong temptation upon people, particularly when they are of the vulnerable youth category. So we think that in many ways the systems that currently exist in society have contributed and didn't really give these people a real choice to decide to, to, to make when they decided to take drugs for the first time in their lives. And we think that you cannot even say that at any point of time the start of the the start of this problem itself was also a decision that these individuals made. If you have a question, I'll take you now. Okay, I'm sick of this idea that 
prison and rehabilitation are totally different things. There are doctors in prison, there are psychologists psychologists in prison. There's a lot of things going on to help prisoners, a lot of programs and stuff. If your opposition to this is going to be the idea that you will have treatment within prisons, I don't really think that's what this motion is about. We are envisaging a world where treatment is distinct from prison. And this treatment is something that is indeed rendered by professionals in that area, whether it be doctors or counselors or anybody else. So we do think that the motion itself recognizes that there's a difference. Sure, you can access, you can perhaps have these things in prison also. But we think it's also important not to put these people in prison because we're sending a message across that these are people who did something so wrong and so great that they deserve to be put in prison in the first place, which is not present when you send them only into medical treatment. So that's also an important distinction that answers your question. Finally, we also think that this is a system that has placed, that places great, that the status quo where we sent them to prison often, is a system that places a great burden on society. Because traditionally, we understand that the cost of sending somebody into prison is not inexpensive for society to bear. On the, we, we see that, for example, the, pe the, the cost of incarcerating people where they have absolutely no ability to productively contribute to society is indeed so high that society ends up paying in effect for these people who have been put behind bars. On the other hand, we think that if they can be undergo this treatment and if they can be rehabilitated and brought back into society, we think there is a possibility that they can indeed contribute back into society by leading perfectly normal and integrated life. So we think that from an economical point of view also, it makes sense for societies to be investing and even bearing the cost of allowing these people to undergo some forms of medical treatment rather than simply putting them in prison. What I told you essentially is that at the principled level we think criminalization should be placed on individuals only when they had a real choice to commit the crimes. Because of the vast influence that society exerts upon these individuals as well as because of the influence of these drugs themselves, we see that this real choice was not an idea that was present for these particular drug offenders <laughs> that we are discussing about today. So we don't think it's fair to send them into prison. We also think that society itself will benefit both economically as well as by being able to tap the potential contributions of these individuals once they're rehabilitated by adopting this policy. So for both these broad themes, we think that this is a proposal that deserves to stand today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What the government proposes to do is basically decouple crime and punishment, and that will have a much greater harm to society, and it's something that we cannot afford to accept. So let me get into it here a bit. Uh, the, the world that they view is basically when you have a drug dependency, you commit a crime based on a drug dependency, that you should be able to just go to a treatment and not go to prison. Now that's wrong, because they don't get into the details of the type of crimes that can exist there. So if you're a drug-filled uh, maniac uh, that's uh, totally dependent, you stab somebody horribly to death, treatment for you, no prison. That's not right. And it's not right because it's unfair, not only, it's unfair to society because it undermines society's principles uh, that crimes and punishment should be matched up. But it's also unfair uh, to the victims of the families of the people that are killed. They, they're talking a lot about fairness to prisoners. We can't forget the fairness to the other people in society. We can't get, forget the fairness to uh, the victims of these crimes. Okay, so let me say a couple of things. I'm going to say, uh, one, that their uh, drug dependency is not distinct from very other, other important uh, issues in society. And that non-distinctness, if we follow their, prison, will lead, or their principle, will lead to worse outcomes. Uh, the second thing, uh, I'm going to say more about how this decouples crime and punishment, and then finally, how this is going to hurt the cause of drug liberalization, and how we think that's very important in this debate. The first thing about this not being distinct, there are many issues in society where people uh, have problems uh, that cause them to commit crimes. Like an example might be anger management or road rage. Now, by their principle, a person who's under this type of uh, psychosis or has this problem perhaps in part fueled by society through violent movies or through uh, 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 like a praising force. Uh, we're basically allowing that same principle to say these people who have road rage should be able to get off, that, that, the, that they should just go to a treatment. So long as you uh, go to a treatment, no prison. We don't think that's right. Uh, we think that means that men that abuse their wives uh, and for a uh, reason because they were angry are going to be able to say, well, just send me to treatment. My dad was bad to me. Society was bad to me. And therefore, I should get off. That's nothing in this world that we would want. Uh, yes, close. But you, would you support it if the cause of his rage could be removed by that therapy? 
Okay, so let's, uh, let me respond to that. Now, imagine we could remove the drug dependency. Let's imagine we could remove the road rage. Even there, and this goes into my second point, is you still need to punish crime. We are totally okay with having treatment to have people remove these problems that may fuel crime. But we still think crime needs to be punished. Now, this is going to be a bit of a case for why crime and why prisons, or, or why punishment and why prisons. Uh, we want the punishment because we think it sends a signal uh, to society that crime should not be accepted. For all of us who are still sane thinking, we will want to know that we shouldn't uh, do bad things because we can end up being hurt for it, we can end up going to prison, we can end up limiting our freedom. Now the other thing about it is we think prisons are good for punishing crime because it can be applied to people of all social classes. They, may, uh, they haven't mentioned any sort of punishment associated with their treatment, but prisons are particularly good because if you're rich or if you have some other thing you can't get out of it, your freedoms will be limited. So uh, that's why we think prison, and very importantly, prisons can also have treatment. So basically what we're doing when we're saying their case is we're getting rid of any sort of punishment, which is very, very bad uh, with this. Yes, before I go on. Do you not think that the same idea of medical treatment can also be applied without distinction to people, whether poor or rich, if they satisfy these conditions? What's the difference? So the problem with your model is that you're going to decouple crime and punishment. So you're going to let people claim that they have some uh, problem that, uh, and that they should get off of it. Now let me bring this to an, let me say two things about this. There was a very nice example from the Prime Minister about, well, what about if a person has a gun to your head? Okay, and they're going to, you have a choice, commit a horrible, horrific crime, or get your brains blown out. Now, it's very hard for many of us to accept, but the moral, the ethical thing there is to have your brains blown out. Now, what we can do, it sounds rough, but that's the moral thing to do here. Um, uh, because when, and you can see this is how we consider people who were in distress situations uh, committing crimes. We often have more empathy for them, just like we have more empathy for the drug users, but we still think those people should be punished for those type of crimes. So the people who collaborated with all sorts of regimes uh, that uh, do horrible things, it's a very uh, comparable situation. Morally, we think those people should also be punished. Um, now going on, and this is uh, my third point, uh, oh no, let me say a little bit more of the problems with decoupling crime and punishment. It's the long-term negative effects. So basically, uh, when we speak in analogies again, uh, what you have is uh, people will no longer continue to uh, obey, you'll have less obeying of the law before their hands, and uh, you basically undermine this long-standing tradition of fitting crime and punishment. Now the third thing I want to talk about is how this is going to hurt the drug liberalization cause. Now for all of us out there who are uh, law-abiding drug, uh, law <laughs> I know, contradiction in terms, some of you are depending on your country. But many, of us, many of us think we should have a right to ingest into our bodies what we want, and that as adults, whether it's alcohol or marijuana or LSD, we should be able to do those types of drugs. And now what's a credible problem with what is being presented to us by the Prime Minister is what we will see an increase in the claims of drug dependency and crime. Now, that's going to feed into all the forces in the world that want to eliminate and reduce our ability to use drugs. They'll be saying, look at the statistics. Our drugs are, uh, drugs are associated with crime. Look at all the people we're having to treat. Uh, therefore, we need to clamp down on drugs even more harshly. That's not a world that we think we should live in. We think we should live in a world that, one, punishes crime, but two, promotes freedom uh, to the greatest extent uh, possible. So, what have I told you? I told you, one, that there are alternatives to what they're proposing. You can have drug treatment inside prison. Uh, so you can get the benefits they want uh, without giving up. The second thing that I told you was that keeping crime and punishment associated to it. Second thing I told you was that the drug dependency is too close to other problems that are perhaps societal driven, for example, anger management, uh, anger management issues, that we shouldn't adopt their principle because it's going to allow excuses for all other sorts of crimes. Uh, third, I told you that prisons are good at, at punishing crime. Uh, they uh, hit all classes of society, and by limiting freedom, something that our side values, that these people are being uh, punished, and that we think that it signals a good thing for society, and that it will uh, reduce crime. And then third, and, uh, fi uh, and importantly, is that this will hurt the cause of drug liberalization. What we're going to do is associate more strongly the drug users with criminals, which we don't believe is the fact. So for those reasons, we should oppose this motion. So what are the things that we heard from the other side? They raid a POI saying that prisons have doctors, psychologists, etc. And thus, what they tried effectively to do was to narrow down the difference between prison and, um, and the homes that we're talking about, the reformation homes. 
What we're telling you right now is that we don't know which prison that guy has been to. But in the prisons that I know of are desolate structures. They aren't areas where you can talk to people and move around and just give a chance to improve yourself. There are areas where you've got 10 by 10 walls and you're locked into that structure and every aspect of your life, including your peak timings, are regulated. So it is not a holiday home that they're telling you it to be. Next, they told us that the relationship, they told us that we're going to decouple crime and punishment. However, I think we already established in our first speech that we only do this when there's a relationship, a tangible relationship between the drug dependence and the crime committed. We're telling you that the treatment will only be available when there's a nexus between the two. So if a man over drinks and the next day goes home and commits fraud, it is not an option for him. We're telling you when there's an actual relation between the two, only then this policy of ours is available, right? Now we're telling you right now is that they spoke about how people have the freedom to consume alcohol and LSD and there's so many other people who will lay claim to this motion as a consequence. Fair point. But we're telling you right now that we're not going to make this available for just everyone. They can claim, oh I was under dependence and therefore I have to go. We will do thorough checks. We'll ensure the medical checks are done upon them and only when it has been checked by certified doctors that this policy will be available to them. Next, they've also told us that um, if the moral thing to do when there's a gun in your head is to get your brains blown out. Now, it's easy to stand here and say that, but when you're at the receiving end of the gun, that is not really a choice for you. And I think that is important for us to understand. When you're there with the gun pointed right towards your head, it is not an option. The only option that you have in this circumstance is to do what is being asked for you to do. And in this situation, the gun that we're so talking about are the drugs because you're dependent on them. Now, we, the, the thing that we need to tell you right now, and this is also a rebuttal to their argument saying that prisons are good at punishing, that in fact, prisons are going to exacerbate the situation. Because here's how it goes, right? A man who's dependent on drugs gets into prison, right? Right. So now he's going to have a certain degree of resentment at the society not having understood his situation. And he's going to have a certain degree of hatred towards society because society never gave him the chance, never gave him the chance to actually do something good. And the only right. fault that he committed in this time was to take a little drug, uh, take some drugs and thus become dependent on them, right? So this right. resentment that might be there within him, and it, it coupled with the fact that prisons being desolate structure, we don't have the opportunity to interact with other people, we're just locked into your own head with the only thing to keep you company are the voices in your head. In this situation, what is this man going to do? He's going to come out of the prison at some point of time and his resentment towards the society that is already bored is only going to increase and that is only going to further crime and punishment because this man now who maybe originally disliked the society is now going to hate it with all vehemence. So in this situation, the, the point that they brought about how it's going to reduce crime and punishment actually shoots themselves in the foot because when this man comes out of prison, he's going to hate everyone who put him there because he in himself is convinced that he was innocent and when the man himself is convinced that he's innocent and we do have reasons to see why he might have been innocent because he was dependent on those drugs I don't think it was his fault and the resentment will only um, culminate into further crimes, right? So what is the message that we as the government are sending forth to the people, right? We're telling you right now that we're not going to be tolerant, that people don't have hope, we don't believe in second chances, we're just going to do what we think what? is right. And I think this message of intolerance is absolutely wrong because people need to have faith in the government and this faith is going to be lost if the government is going to be so intolerant towards people who don't, who, who do something wrong. And we don't think these wrongs are crimes because in, in a crime it's absolutely essential that you need to have a mental element present. And this mental element is absent from a person who's going to do drugs. So we're telling you right now that we're going to be intolerant towards people who haven't really committed crime in the technical sense, who just done something wrong towards the society for no fault of their own, and thus we're putting them into prison and we're sending forth the message of intolerance, right? Now, a little way, so uh, uh, let's compare what was going to happen if you have prisons and let's compare what's going to happen if you have treatments, right? I already told you how prisons are a bad place for these people to be in the current situation, right? We're telling you right now that treatment in this situation is actually going to improve their condition and it's only good and it's also going to solve their dependency issue because we're giving them a better environment, we're giving them a chance to interact with people who are there in similar environments who face similar situations and we're giving them the, the option of talking to such people to see what's actually happening in the lives of others and we're letting them come out of their shell because of which they entered into dependency in the first place, right? So putting them into prison is going to make them more lonely and more desolate. Giving them treatment is not doing this. So it's actually a high possibility and I I wouldn't say that if it was highly probable, is that when these people meet others, when they have this open environment, when they get the chance, the second chance that the government is providing them with, these people will actually not revert to crime and come out as reformed citizens who A, won't do crimes again because they did them when they were addicted to drugs, and second, they would also not do them because they would see that society has given them a second chance, right? But we are also telling you that this will not only reduce the crime rate in general, we are telling you that this will also reduce uh, reduce the drug dependency that's there in the first place, right? Why do a majority of the people get into drug dependency? Not abuse, I mean, I, I'm telling you, I'm talking about dependency. 
what people do is when they get into drug dependency is because they're depressed, they don't have hope in life, they will be leading more oh. existences. But when people get addicted to drugs in such situations, they, 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 didn't, they, they didn't do it voluntarily. They didn't really have the option of doing anything about it. And in this situation, when these people they have no hope in life, they're going to solve this problem too. So the major cause of the dependency in the first place is this depression that exists in the lives of people. It's also being eradicated. And how? Because now we're telling them that we're giving you a second chance. We're telling them right now that you can go into these treatment homes, that you're not criminals, that you're not going to be ostracized from society, that you've not done something as wrong as other people who have murdered others in cold blood as terrorists have done and in this circumstance we're giving them the choice the choice of actually improving and coming back into the society as improved citizens right we're telling them that this is an opportunity to meet others and who might have similar problems and in this circumstance we're only going to improve their situation right i'll take one before yeah, yeah. I'll take this. thank you we may be open to treatment and then punishment, or punishment and then, then treatment. But how can you eliminate punishment completely for people who say in a drug? We're telling you right now that we're eliminating punishment completely because what they have done is not a crime. That is what that is the stance that we're trying to take. And I'm sorry that I have to say it in the DPMC because the PM made it evident enough. In a crime, uh, a mental element needs to be present. There needs to be mens rea, and this mens rea is absent when a person who is dependent upon drugs and not abusing him for leisure like LSG uh, people often do is dependent upon them for his survival in the status quo is doing such a thing, we do not believe that it is a crime. We think that it is wrong that it might be addressed in a future purpose, but it is not a crime. It is not equivalent to a person going and raping a woman just because he wanted to. It is not equivalent to terrorist attacks. It is not equivalent to just cold that is murder, right? So we're giving them this open environment in treatment houses, and we're giving them the chance to get out of this depression. So what is our model doing right now? A, we're not ostracizing these people, and we believe that these people still have hope, and we're inducing faith in them, because we're telling them we're giving you a second chance. Next, we're actually removing the root cause of the depression that, that of the drug dependence that exists in the first place because this problem of dependency that's present because of the depression that these people have in their lives will ex be exacerbated if you put them into a 4x4 four four cell and say you're stuck there for 10 years. We're telling you right now that we are actually removing this problem in the first place. So when this person comes out of treatment, out of that environment that has been so securely put there for him, this depression that's going to exist in his life will also be eradicated. So A, not only will he not commit crimes again and B, he will also get rid of the dependence that was there in the first place. Right? What is their model going to do? Their model is going to take these people who did not commit crimes in the first place, put them into a 4x4 four four cell and then when they come out, they're going to be angry, desolate, ostracized people and this is only going to further crime while victimizing a man who was perfectly innocent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm going to talk mainly about the, what we see to, we, we see to believe uh, the biggest problem on the, the government eventually think uh, is around the word choice. But what we want to phrase it like is a decoupling from uh, individual autonomy when it comes to the whole portrayal of the case. And we think that's incredibly problematic when it comes to crime, to punishment, but also when it comes to individuals itself. Whenever you assert that an individual has no autonomy whatsoever over the choice, over the action of taking drugs to begin with, over the action of doing whatever those drugs might let you to do, over the, the choice of what do you do in those spare, lucid moments you have between taking the next dosage overall, where you have the choice of getting treatment or getting more drugs, we believe that's incredibly bad. Now, it's incredibly bad because it leads to a lot of problems in our society and we think that's, that those are very bad to begin with. Before I go into that, I'm going to bring some points of rebuttal. First, we're being told that the, the prison system is, uh, does not allow for treatment uh, as, it, as, as we, we imagine it to be. Now, in most prison, prisons in the Western liberal world, there are certain functions that the prison actually met. One of their functions is rehabilitation, the other one is uh, re-education. But the thing is that if you actually have diabetes in the prison going out that nowadays, you will receive insulin. If you actually have a pain uh, a condition that requires you to be on painkillers, you will receive you will receive painkillers. If you actually have uh, chronic uh, Hep C, you will actually receive uh, interferon for your disease. So our prisons nowadays are equipped in such a way that you will actually be able to cope with with anything that might be, uh, emerge from a medical condition that you might have within the prison system as okay. we know. The debate today here is whether we should. We should believe that those individuals that commit the crime to begin with have no authority whatsoever over the action and they should be absolute, absolutely from any punishment that might derive from this and they should only receive treatment because we assume that after they receive treatment they will be good people again. Now, so the, that, that should be, that should go on the opposition side. But further on, we're also told, and this is very dangerous in my perspective, that they haven't really committed a crime. So let's imagine that situation. Imagine that a man just kidnaps a lady on the street, <laughs> decides to have his way with her. And if you are a drug addict, that particular action is called an accident. If you're not a drug addict, that particular action is called rape. So if we don't, what the question here is, what criteria do, you, do we use to actually define the crime? 
And we believe that the only criteria that we can use as a society is to judge the action itself. Now, there are certain things we do consider when it comes to the influence on those particular individuals and the actions they might do, but the legal system actually deals with those situations. And there are very many examples of this, but one of the most relevant ex examples is the mental illness example, because that is a situation in which there is no question whatsoever that having the mental illness was your fault. So in that situation, the, the prison system actually deals with that. The legal system deals with that. How does it deal with that? You go to a mental facility. We believe that is the case in which going to another facility in the prison is justified because there is no question on whether you have a choice on having the mental illness or not. But there is a question in, in the situation of taking drugs to begin with or not. Because imagine the kid in the neighborhood or in the village or wherever decide having pre being presented with a choice of taking drugs. <laughs> So you're assuming that society overall contributed to that choice in, su in such a way that there was no whatsoever autonomy of that particular individual in any of those particular situations. But imagine the same situation without not taking drugs. Imagine the kid coming from an orphanage that never took drugs, that society was o that was always discriminated by society. That particular individual under the case uh, of the uh, of, of the government would actually suffer the same blame of being being uh, called a criminal just because he didn't take drugs. So a lot of societal conditions actually confront us with making a lot of choices that might not be good. We believe that society is very bad in those terms. We believe that if that is the criteria, what society does to us, then that should be the criteria, not whether we take drugs or not. I'll take you now. If you're okay with sending the 14-year-old who was pushed by social and peer pressure into trying drugs for the first time to prison, then you must also be okay with removing any sort of protection for juveniles who commit crimes, because it doesn't matter that they didn't really understand what they were doing. Well, I think that whatever is consistent in our case, we will today have to say we're consistent with that. But the question here is that you have a lot of, you didn't really argue that having prisons at all, that having punishments at all are, are the way we should go in society. Why is that, and why, why you cannot argue for that? Because we have established for punishments and for prisons to begin with, right? So we do believe that if you commit a bad action within our society, there should be, should be a signal that for all the others, that that action should not be committed again. And that's very important. And you take that away without having the privacy to begin with. So the question is, who should go there? And as a society, we, we settle the question very simply. Say that if we can prove that there is no mental capacity whatsoever for you to make that crime, we'll go to another institution that has the same protection level for the society, by the way. And not if there is no way for you to go out unless there is a very clear way of you being able to go out afterwards. But further on, we do believe that that's actually meant on one hand to actually protect the individual himself within, a, within the system, but also it is the punishment that will actually affect all the individuals in society to the same extent by taking freedom away and then protecting the society further on. So from that perspective, having prison system is good, but also, we also believe that the criteria to set what crime is, is the action itself. Now, when it comes to actually ameliorating for any other effects, we, the judicial system, as you know, is good enough for that. We think we shouldn't really settle the question for it, for it as it is. Because we do have degrees of, of, of crimes happening in our society, right? If you prevent a crime, you'll get a bigger punishment than if you haven't prevented a crime. So those kind of things are taken into account, but eliminating any type of punishment at any type of rate has a lot of bad consequences in our, in our society, and we should not have that to begin with. Now, as I told you, the biggest problem is that we assume that that particular individual has no choice whatsoever. If we assume that that particular choice, that, that particular individual has no choice whatsoever, we actually take away the humanity of that individual to, be, to, be, to begin with. We take the autonomy that individual has to begin with. It is an insult. Everyone, every kid coming from a bad situation that made a good choice, that, that saw the possibility of making a good choice, uh, and did so. So from that perspective, we do believe we have to differentiate between coming from bad, people coming from bad environments that made good choices and people that didn't make good choices whatsoever. There is no situation which you can imagine that there is no choice whatsoever, no autonomy whatsoever. AJ pointed out that even in a very radical example uh, that the government brought to our patient, there is a choice that you can make and there is a better choice you can make also. But the other problem in the example is that we cannot take the drug to the staff. So from this perspective, we cannot take the society to the staff. But so from this perspective, there is no retribution element that will actually repair the situation for the society. But what we can do is make, make it clear that it, there, is, there is such a thing that regardless of the state that you are in, even if you you're a drunk driver, that's another example that we have in our society. So if you decide to drink something, you are drunk, you might be a drug addict from that, uh, an alcohol addict from that perspective. If you drink and drive and you kill someone, you go to prison. And that is the type of thing that we have to, we have to bear in mind. So we have those examples, we deal with that. But we believe that it's important to tell society that if you made a bad choice to begin with taking drugs, there are ways to get out of it. But the way to get out of it is not to commit a crime and go to the, the treatment afterwards. So from that perspective, because there is a crime to begin with, 
because the crime should be punished for the well-being of our society, because prisons can be formulated for treatment, we beg you to propose. Oppose. <laughs> Thank you for the floor. Now, firstly, what we want to establish as the closing government here is that we don't think that absolute retribution, as such, should be a basic principle for any policy that should be a criminal policy. We think that resolving social problems and having a better society later on should be the criteria for measurement of something. We don't think that justice and retribution as itself is a value enough for us to outweigh the values of the stability of our society and of lessening crime rates in our society. And that's what basically is our philosophy today. But to move on to our case, I will not uh, talk about uh, my points in the future, so, not, so, so I, I don't waste my time. One, what we say about the deterrent factor. They say, you know, the deterrent factor will not exist anymore. Nobody wants to be sick, even if we say that this is a disease. Nobody wants to have that disease. Nobody wants to be a dirty crack addict. We, all, we already have that sort of deterrent. Second deterrent that we already have, if we don't have jails, is it because our families are telling us that that's extremely bad. And our society is constantly telling us that that's bad. The fact that they're not going to jail doesn't send a message that it is, this is outright good. So you, you already have that in <coughs> reality. Now, about rationality, that's very important here. Now, we already have a rationality as a category in our legal system, right? We have the murder of first degree, we have the murder of second degree, in relations to how rational you were in that time, and what were you thinking about, and how did you do it. So basically, we already have that category. These people are not rational actors at all. And the presumption what? of deterrence is rationality, because you have to have some sort of a cost-benefit analysis if you want deterrence to work. And you cannot make a cost-benefit, a rational cost-benefit analysis of you know, whether I should take a fix or go to jail. Mm -hmm. If you are irrational, if you are physiologically and psychologically completely into your drugs, into heroin, into crack, etc. And now one brief point, it will not harm the legalization movement because nobody here, is, will, nobody ever will advocate the legalization of, of full legalization of heroin and crack. But we don't see how this actually harms the legalization of marijuana movement in any way. So we don't think that's an issue in this debate. But about the point which is, in our opinion, very important, and that is utilitarianism, which we want to finish up in this part of the rebellion. Thank you. And that is, uh, we have a problem, ladies and gentlemen, which is humongous in our society. We have the war on drugs, which is not working. We have the crowded jails, which are not working on two levels. One, they have more and more people, and we have more and more crime. <coughs> two, they, be, they, they became a, a center for disseminating crime further on in our societies. We don't think that jail, put them in jail because it's a punishment, is a reason enough for us to, to, to not stop something that is a completely harmful policy for us. We want a better society, we don't want just to say they should be punished, and we don't think that that is a reason enough. Now, moving on to the very important point of autonomy, and our first point is about psychology and dehumanization of it all. She says, autonomy, ladies and gentlemen, is something that is very important with humans, you know, individual autonomy. Now, what we are saying here, and that is our first point, point, point first very big point, nothing here, uh, is that prison, de de uh, prison is basically an element in which you lose your humanity, through which you lose your humanity. And why is this a problem? And what, how does this happen? Well, you get into prison, you get completely locked up, you became a number, right? You, do, you are not a human being anymore. You are completely disregarded as human, and you are not respected in that prison. In prison, it is not good for them, for you to be a persona, for you to develop yourself. Because if you think too much, if you develop yourself too much, if you are not a number, you might think about making some problems in that prison, about causing problems in prison. The system of prison works that way by completely removing you of your dignity and your humanity. Everything is controlled. You, wherever you go and whatever you do is completely controlled. And ladies and gentlemen, that destroys individual autonomy forever. And not Point. only in this, in this sense and in this regard. And why is this a problem? Well, because you are already in a situation when you have lost your humanity, right? You are on drugs. You feel completely detached of everything human. You feel like an animal which has to take a fix. In that state, you hate yourself. You hate everything you Point. do, but you, have, no, thank you. but you have to do it. And because of that, you don't respect yourself, and you don't have any feeling that your life is valuable and it is worth saving. If you go directly to prison, what happens is that you get another form of dehumanization, ladies and gentlemen. 
You get a dehumanization in which you are completely condemned, in which you are worthless, but punished because you are worthless. And we believe that psychologically this makes no sense in order for these people to be better off in the society. And why is this more important? Because if these people are better off, they're going to go back to crime, and we will not solve any societal problem, and yes, maybe they're going to be punished, but we will not solve any more important problem than that. And that is the problem in this. And why is it also relevant, which is the second point of the, the second side of the same coin, basically. And this is it. The way to stay clean in long, on a long-term basis is to be psychologically stable, is to do it when you are on your own. Jail doesn't work that, doesn't work that way, but rehab does. Rehab works with you like with a human Point. being. Rehab develops you as a human being, and rehab uh, treats you as someone who should rebuild himself, okay? Rebuilding, reconceptualizing, reimagining yourself. And when you reimagine yourself, in that way, we believe that that is a long-term <coughs> progress. Because when you are alone and when you are not controlled because we cannot control you 24-7, then you will not take drugs. When you are in a crisis, you will not take drugs because you respect yourself and you will if you think that you are worthless, uh, you, you are completely worthless and that you do not deserve to live as you feel in prison. Now, before I move on to my second point of analysis, go. We're not talking about that old system of prisons where they torture you and they beat you up. As like exactly great. like you're not talking about great. that therapy about lobotomy or something. Yeah, great, 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 great. And this is completely something that is uh, contradicting to your case, to your point, which is probably, which is probably not your case. And that is, uh, rehab doesn't work in prison, ladies and gentlemen. Now, uh, one, what, what happens in prison that you, uh, you have two reasons to become a part of an organized criminal group. One, you need drugs. They have drugs, they give you drugs, and you have to have that fix. Therefore, you become a part of a group. When you become a part of that group, you start behaving like them in order to remain in that group. The second reason is, of course, security. You have to be in some sort of group. And, and in prison, unfortunately, we don't have good Samaritans. But all groups are in some form of organized crime. And that is a problem because you get into crime and you cannot get out of it. When you get out of prison, when you get out of prison, these groups, Oh, uh, you owe something to these groups, so they use you even more. So when you get out of prison, you basically either go to more crime, A or B, continue using drugs because you have already used it in prison. And that's a problem that we see that if you are not solving. Rehab in prison cannot work because of these influences of other groups who are doing that. Now, what is also important here is basically that this will have a positive influence on jails, of course, because when you don't have these criminals in jails, jails will not stay what they are in this, in this time, and that is the center for disseminating of organized crime, especially when it comes to drugs, because this is the most profitable area in this. Because this is completely useless policy, in order to make a better society, we beg you to propose this one. basically that if I get, if I want cool friends, aka as in the first government, with, I have a gun to my head, um, I am entitled to do anything in the world because I have been put, uh, the, uh, my friends put me up to. We believe that this is not an excuse. We believe this is wrong and we believe you should still be punished if you do bad things. This is not an excuse. Okay, so let's hear this. First half tells us that, okay, um, we're not, uh, this is not a re retribution versus rehabilitation debate, I think that's important. We don't want to make this an excuse. And what they, what the presumption that they're going on is that everybody that has smoker friends smokes because pressure, because pressure is so big that nobody can go against it. We think this is false. The second of all, we, even, uh, we believe that the, the, the second, uh, first half also told us that um, in their country, prisons are really bad and not free and not whatever. In my country, we don't have rehabilitation at all. Obviously, we're talking about places where both of these things are working properly. Okay, second of all, uh, they're, they're, they were knifing each other about the reasons people take drugs. First half told us uh, depression and friends. Second half told us something about how you're, you, want, you, you want to take drugs, so that's why you go to make cool friends, whatever, we don't care. Um, and now let's go on to the second half. Tell us that, um, the, this is, besides the fact that it's an excuse, that prison the, dehumanizes you and makes you feel worthless. Well, no, and, and for one thing, and they also tell you that you, if you try to get educated and if you try to change yourself in prison, that means that you're going to be seen as one of those people that might cause problems. So essentially what they're telling us is that if you're trying to change in prison, that's making you evil. Well, we don't believe that, we don't buy that. There are people who educate themselves in prison and go out of prison and become nice people and working in society very well. Okay, and um, yeah, okay.
Sure. Now let's go on to who exactly are we talking about then to the preferential treatment that was going to be my extension. This uh, the purpose of uh, prison, which is gonna, also going to be my extension. And how does prison help people, which is also going to be my extension. Sure. Now, preferential treatment. What that, basic, what that policy is basically saying is, did you steal money? You are a bad person. Did you steal money for drugs? Uh, that, that's kind of okay. Did you steal money like Jean Valjean because you didn't have money to buy bread? You're an evil person. Go to prison. We believe this is bad. We believe this is fundamentally wrong. Besides that, their blanket policy, because they're talking about all drugs, if you take any kind of drugs, we, believe, we actually believe that more criminals are going to start taking drugs to be able to purposefully get through with this excuse. Because what they're going to be, that you can take marijuana once every night and during the day go rob people. That's what, they're, that's what, that, that, that's what kind of they're talking about. And besides, these sort of blanket policies don't work because people take drugs for a lot of reasons. People take them, uh, people do crimes for a lot of reasons, and not all drug addicts do crimes while they're on drugs. Okay, I believe that these are questions that they're not answered. Second of all, the purpose, uh, well, let's talk about the purpose of prison, because the purpose of prison is to make you a better person in the end. Let's see how this is done. It's the, firstly to take you off the street where you're dangerous, and for a relatively long period of time to punish you for doing something bad because these are people who first of all, we must understand the psychology that goes behind these people. First of all, and you're depressed. Let's take this example. There are many, but let's take this one. You're depressed and instead of going to the doctor or whatever, but you say, okay, let's do something illegal taking drugs. Well, after you have took drugs, you said, okay, let's do something else illegal. Let's rob someone to get money to do something else illegal, take other drugs. And then let's do something else which is right now illegal. Let's use it as an excuse to get out of prison. <laughs> Bad idea. We really believe that this is not the way to go. Okay, so the idea is that the prison system takes you off the street for enough time to change you, unlike rehabilitation who only wants you to get off drugs. It wants to change you as a person. and wants to change you. Uh, and that's what prison has psychologists. That's what prison has doctors. Because rehabilitation and the prison system work together inside the prison where you also get punished and where which is also acting as a deterrent for people who haven't yet succumbed to the idea that okay I'm depressed it's okay not to go to the doctor and buy uh, and instead buy drugs and go through that whole change the chain that I um, that I talked to you about. Yeah. Considering that we made the difference between drug consumption and drug dependence clear enough, how does this point of yours still hold any validity? Drug violence and drug what? Consumption? Drug consumption and drug dependence. We've made the distinction clear okay, enough. Okay, sure, fine, fine. So, it's okay, so criminals will now become drug addicts, not just consume drugs. Fine. We believe that people who murder other people would do this to avoid going to jail for life. We believe that people who would go five years into prison would become cocaine addicts to avoid being five years in prison and instead going into a fluffy rehabilitation center for five months. We believe that this is a legitimate excuse that people will use in real life. I would use it. I definitely would go to five Besides that, I have friends that I don't do drugs. I have friends with, that do drugs. I don't do drugs. What is this? Okay. <laughs> Second, furthermore, let's see how, how prison actually helps everyone involved for every reason. They tell us about the people that do it because of peer pressure. And they also tell us that um, if you go to prison, you'll hate everybody and everything that made you go to prison. That's great. You'll hate your former friends. You'll find new, nicer friends who will respect the law and not take drugs. We believe this is wonderful. Um, even if this doesn't happen, it at least they, they, these mostly are juvenile. So it takes you away from the juvenile committee in the, the, for your high school friends that made you do weed because it was cool. It, it takes you away from that and puts you in an environment where you can't do drugs. And when you come out of there, your friends will most probably have moved away from their parents' house and not be there. Also celebrities. Celebrities do drugs because they have too much money and nothing to do with it. And they just want to have fun or whatever. No, or, mm, they, they, mm, they take that pressure off as well. They make you unhirable. They make, him, they make you live off of the money that you already earned. And that just makes you, um, that just makes you into a nicer person. And also the people with depression. In, in prison, you get treatment for depression. That helps you out in the long run as well. So, for all these reasons, let's mm, tell, talk about them again. Let's not give criminals an excuse to get a, free, a get out of jail free card plus weed. Let's skip this step of nonsense 
and let's try to actually punish the people who deserve to be punished instead of legitimizing the oh I was drunk so what so what I didn't I, I, I didn't notice that she didn't want to have sex I was drunk who cares this is the exact same kind of excuse oh I puked sorry I, I drank too much that is not the kind of excuse that we want in our society and we think that prison can get rid of that thank you. It's not funny, and if anybody of you, of you ever knew an addict that's trying to kick his habit, that's trying to rebuild his life and the family that's going through him, uh, through all that he's going through, trying to help him and failing again and again, you realize it's not funny and it's not easy. We will proudly stand that this debate is really not about morals, because we define morals as, as cost-benefit analysis of what happens to society. And when we talk about that, we need to engage in with punishment that is needed by the first opposition. And we say punishment is proportional to rationality. What these guys don't get is that nobody chooses to be an addict. You sometimes choose to do drugs, but you never choose to become an addict. And at the time that you do, you don't have the free choice to kick that habit anymore. At that point, even the first prop said that all the silly little things that he brings up are not in the plan. Because we're talking about people addicted and people doing criminal actions because they are addicted. So rich people also are not in the plan because they don't tend to do criminal activity in order to get the fix. This simply doesn't happen to them because they have unlimited money. Point of point. The other point that the opposition brings us is that they say, well, people feel safe, and people should feel safe, therefore you should punish them. We feel that people will feel safer when we have less drug addicts in the streets doing less crime, and we feel that that's the way to make them safe. Also, less respect of the law will not come then, because if people see that this policy is effective, then they will cherish it and realize that these people are sick and in need of help. Finally. If we can remove the cause of what happened here, we are perfectly fine with them sending them up to rehabilitation and not punish them. If we can really truly help them and remove the cause of why they've done the crime. And this is where the analogy with drunk driving falls down. Because in this case, we really can't do it. So now, when we establish that it's a morally right thing to do, we need to examine how do we create a system that then enables for that morality to actually gain the benefits for society and fall on our side. So first of all, that these guys don't realize is that not that we're saying that the, uh, the prisons are necessarily awful, but they are somewhat uncontrollable. And also, in, at the point where point. those drug addicts go into those prisons, you're putting them with the same drug dealers that were pushing drugs to them in the streets. The first thing that they need when they come into prison is another fix. This is, this, this is why they tend to institutionalize. They become part of those gangs, and then they, once they go out of, of prison, they, go, they work for those gangs furthermore, and then recidiv recidivism then increases massively. They say that some nice people actually go out of prisons. We see that more nice people go out of rehab centers, so therefore your equation is really not that smart. Second of all, they have an idea of how we can have a cross-section between two policies. That when you have rehab within prison. Well, first of all, it's impossible because of what you say. You say that they will hate the system. Once you decide to hate the system, the next thing you decide is to find the group that hates the system with you, and those are the other prisoners. So that's, this is why you will tend to organize in that group and reject the teachings that you've been given through, uh, through the prison. Second of all, <coughs> you can't have it both ways. You, they are, can either be sick or they can be guilty. If we're going to have a serious conversation as a society about them, we feel that it's necessary to acknowledge their sickness and that they don't have a choice at that particular time. And then we can, uh, we can engage them as individuals. If they feel that, they're much more likely to take control over what they do. <coughs> also, that means that the, uh, the other parts of the system, such as police, and other people then view them differently, which is fundamental when they need to take them into the system and actually cure them. Final point is how do we help the individual? But before that opening, 
Thank you very much. And thank you for your statement about the sickness and the tragic situation these addicts are in. But many of us are, have the sicknesses imposed on us of our society of misogyny or ethnic hatred. Should we excuse those crimes as well? Can you remove that thing? If there was effective therapy to remove your anger because somebody had did the misogynist deed against you, we say yes. And this is fundamentally different in this case because these people do criminal actions in order to get drugs. Once you remove the, the need to get drugs, they are no longer criminals. And that's, this is why we are prepared to get, let them go back into society. Now, how do we help the individual? First of all, we have an idea on first opposition that says, we'll do deterrence. But the deterrence clearly doesn't work because we already established that they're not rational actors. Nobody go, no drug addict is going to actually think, oh my god, I might go to jail, I will not do this, I will not uh, rob a bank in order, to get, uh, in order to get another fix. Because the only thing that's ra that they are thinking about is actually getting the new point of No. Second idea that they bring us is that somehow we need to reward good behavior. And that w there are lots of people who have lots of problems and we cannot just reward these people who took the easy way, the easy route, or didn't fight because point. Then it doesn't happen. Well, we say that being on drugs is actually punishment enough for those bad decisions. When he talks about fluffy rehab centers, he has clearly never seen a man on detox. Somebody who is shivering and not being able to control his bladder. When you see that, you realize there's nothing fluffy about it. We feel that these people have been punished enough by the fact that they are have this addiction. So how do we help them? The only way you can is by humanizing them. The only way you can is do not do what they do in prisons, which is they remove every possible aspect of you as an individual and say, then you are a number, and then we can control you, and we can control when you sleep. Because the fundamental decision a drug addict makes is to respect himself. All of them hate their addiction, but they cannot kick it because they don't value themselves enough to say, I really need something else. And I am more valuable than getting that other fix. So, at that point, when they make that decision, then that is the only way for them to kick the habit. Because no monitoring can ever work. Because there are chips that they are prepared to put in that are activated when they inject this certain drug. After they remove the chips, they still recidivize. The only way is for them to respect themselves. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I have no less than five points for you today. So first of all, I'm going to talk about freedom of choice in the case of drug addicts. Now I'm going to move on to discussing the effect of treatment upon these prisoners. Then I'm going to talk about what's actually going on in prisons and what the government wants us to believe. And then fourthly, I'm going to talk about the abuses and the extension that the second opposition has actually put forward. And finally, I'm going to talk about how this policy is actually unjustifiably discriminatory and sends an illegitimate message to society. So now let's move on to the first point, that is, freedom of choice. What we heard from both government teams today was that actually all drug, drug addicts need to be excused for their behavior whenever they're committing criminal offenses because they have no real fr freedom to choose whether or not they want to commit the offense and because the mental element is allegedly absent. What we say in response to this and what the second opposition actually pointed out is actually a two-fold response. So first of all, not all drugs are the same. We don't think that, all, uh, that if a person takes marijuana or, t or if a person takes a small dose of a hard drug, it, that will have automatically the effect of invalidating his ability to make autonomous free choices. Second of all, we don't think that uh, all drug addicts are the same. In the sense that uh, what, what the government has tried to do is to portray the drug addicts as people who are actually ended up uh, having to take drugs because of society, because of ineffective regulation, 
ineffective education, and so on and so forth. However, we say that drug addicts are actually different. We have celebrities who voluntarily, freely choose to do drugs. We have people who do drugs out of curiosity. We have tourists who go to Amsterdam to actually try weed there. And we think that these people make informed choices to take drugs. And then we hear from the second team of the government this distinction, which we say is unworkable, between drug addiction, between just consuming drugs and becoming a drug addict. We don't think that this distinction actually holds because people know in general that most drugs actually cause addiction and when you decide to actually uh, consume a drug then automatically you can send to a risk of becoming addicted to that substance and we believe that it would be illegitimate in this circumstance to actually say that no, 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 you actually didn't have a choice. You, did, you had to take those drugs, you, did, you became addicted out of a fa fatality as the government would like us to believe. Secondly, let's talk about the effect of treatment. We don't think that actually medical treatment works in all circumstances. And secondly, the second main shortcoming of medical treatment is that it doesn't affect all the relevant aspects of a person's behavior. We don't think that drug addicts can satisfactorily be, uh, be handled by just giving them medical treatment and by allowing them to escape imprisonment. We don't think that in all situations, actually, medical treatment will have the effect that we want it to have. And even if it, it, it will fully function, all that it will do is, is that it will, phys it will cure that drug, drug addict of his addiction, which is an essentially physical phenomenon, without actually addressing the psychological component and the peer pressure component, the fact that they uh, are part of malicious peer groups. We think that these elements are completely unaddressed by merely putting them into a medical treatment center. And I'm going to take your point before talking about prisons. How exactly do peer groups in prison talk to peer groups out of prison? Well, thank you for bringing me to my next point, which is prisons and what happens in prisons. We say that in addition, in addition to actually the treatment which, prisoner, which drug addicts actually get in prison, because that if we imprison them, not to say we don't offer them the same treatment they would get in a medical center, they, we still give them that, but in addition to that we imprison them and we also address the psychological component of their acts, of their offenses, plus we make them, uh, we offer them punishment for their acts and we think that's important as well. So what we heard from the first speaker of the, and second speaker of the second government is actually that Prisons are institutions which are designed to humiliate people and are inhuman and putting uh, offenders into them is actually a knowledge to make practice. However, what we say is that rather than having the purpose of humiliating offenders, prisons merely have the purpose of changing people, at least modern prisons do. It's not like in those old American movies where guardians take advantage of prisoners and beat them up as they will. We have things like human rights and prisoners' rights, and we think that in prisons there's actually a controlled environment which minimizes the chances of organized uh, crime groups actually forming in there. But in addition to this, most importantly, what happens to a person if they go to a medical treatment center for a while until they become cured of their addiction and then they are released without actually facing also a, a, a period of imprisonment in addition to this period of medical rehabilitation? We think that in most cases, and most often than not, they will go back to the same peer groups which actually force them to do drugs in the first place. And this component is totally, completely unaddressed by giving them solely and exclusively medical treatment. Whereas in, mod in modern prison prisons, which actually work again, we have things like psychologists, which actually, who actually go and work with these prisoners in order to minimize the chances of them coming back to the same behavior well, uh, which caused their impris imprisonment in the first place. So we think that by failing to address this important component, by failing to minimize the chances of drug addicts actually going back to the same, the same pressure groups, in fairness, yes, without their addiction, that's nonetheless likely that they will go back to their old habits or else by putting them in prison, by telling them that that's actually wrong, and by re-educating and rehabilitating them, we actually address this worry. But yeah. By focusing on people like celebrities who you claim had a real choice, you're impliedly telling us that you agree with our case if these people didn't in fact have a real choice when it comes to that. So why don't you deal with that part of our case? Well, well I, I believe I've already dealt with it quite comprehensively in my first point, in the sense that people, ce celebrities are perhaps in the best position to actually make an autonomous free choice whether or not to take drugs, because they are most often not part of such peer groups. And even if they are, then we should put them in prison to make them change their behavior. I mean, I think this argument holds for celebrities as well. Now, moving on to the fourth point, and for, more specifically to our extension, which uh, is mainly focused on abuses. We don't think that criminals are naive. And we do think that they will do everything that lays within their powers to actually escape imprisonment after committing a certain crime. And we think that especially, this is particularly strong in relation to premeditated crimes, where people could actually try to become apparent addicts or even 
full on addicts in order to escape punishment for a horrendous, horrific crime they are planning to commit. In those cases, why should we actually allow them to take advantage of this policy, blanket policy, which is indiscriminatory? Well, we don't actually understand why it's indiscriminatory now because the mother proposed by the government was not entirely clear. But in any event, we don't see why anybody should be allowed to take advantage of this. And indeed, the message we're sending is not that drugs are good or acceptable in any sort of way, but we are, we do, we are sending the message that this is an acceptable excuse. And this brings me to my final point, which is uh, that this sort of message is completely illegitimate and could potentially go down the slippery slope. So in these circumstances, shall we actually say that Brad didn't have an autonomous straight ahead to commit an offense in order to secure the funds they needed in order to buy drugs? But how about people who are just hungry and want to steal food? Why not give them a defense as well? Why not extend? Where else could this policy potentially extend if we start a uh, slippery slope and if we legitimize excuses such as this one? And there have been examples in the opposition case in relation to alcohol, drunk driving, and so on. And we believe that this adopting this policy could potentially take us on this dangerous route. So for all these reasons, we beg you to oppose this motion.